upside down. That's what Eduardo Galeano describes our world today. He says we are living in an upside down world where the worst violators of human nature are not condemned, but instead reap the most rapacious profits. Where our children are used and abused and thrown out and in this distorted mirror that we look through, that this is seen as normal and acceptable. And in this upside down world, we have a responsibility to do something about it. So then what then are we supposed to do? I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, the daughter of immigrants. My father, uh, who came here when he landed on these shores, renamed himself Golden Gim in honor of a country that had adopted him and which he would now call home. And I believe that this view of this country through these golden eyes of his um, defines his life today. And I'll tap into that spirit a little bit as we talk about some of the more challenging issues as we face as a city, as a nation, especially when we talk about our public schools. Um, as the daughter of immigrants, I didn't have that much growing up. And a lot of what I received and what our family relied on were the public spaces, um, which provided us with an enormous sense of opportunity. I spent an enormous amount of time in the places like my public library, my rec center, the parks, and of course my public school. These places were enormous equalizers. They showed me and opened me up to a whole host of different opportunities, ideas, exposed me to people. Um, I had opportunities that I would never have had otherwise. And in a very deeply personal way, they showed me what it meant when a society provides opportunities for its people. And I think a lot about that when I think about what our public schools are like today. I have three children in the public schools. Uh, they're 16, 14, and 10. And of course, as a parent, the things that we think about with our public schools, as Simran has said earlier and many others have mentioned, is we talk about an overwhelming sense of love, of hope and expectations. And I want to tap into a little bit of that as we think about that. Because what else are our public schools if they are not fundamentally an institutionalization of a society's love for its children, of its possibilities for hope and expectations? And so what we give them are these buildings, and we fill them up with books and materials and supplies. We give them teachers that we value. We offer them science labs and arts and orchestra and the music. And we hope that with these opportunities, they'll go out and find their intellectual curiosity, develop their critical thinking skills. They'll celebrate their artistic expression. We will seek to teach them civic values. We hope they find justice. And at the end of the day, we will prepare them to change the world. Schools can also be something else that we have thought about in many other places. I believe the strength of our nation lies in the diversity of our communities. Our public schools hold many immigrant families who are laying down roots for the very first time in our city. They hold families whose children have multiple needs and abilities that need us to rethink our level of service to them. We crisscross race, class, income, education. There are 80 different languages in the school district of Philadelphia that are spoken. And we have an enormous responsibility. And we also have an enormous opportunity. This diversity calls us to create and establish places that nurture a sense of community. We open up space to one another. We think about ways that we can expand our understanding of other people's experiences. And we learn to grow, not just technologically, which we're very good at, but we learn to grow fundamentally as, human, as humans and as fellow neighbors. And of course, this is not a perfect enterprise, not in any bit of, 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 uh, of the imagination. We face serious issues in our schools. We face racism, poverty. We face um, sexism, homophobia, and that these are very serious issues of justice and inequity, civil rights. And I want us to think, though, that our young people have really risen to this cause. In one instance, a group of young immigrant students um, facing racial violence at their school launched a civil rights campaign at their school that called for a discussion about race, that called for um, stable leadership at a school that had seen four principals in five years. This year, their principal will see their first, his first ninth grade graduate as seniors. And that will be the first time in a generation that that has happened at that school. That is a stunning achievement. Our young people have also been able to be at the front end of the national dialogue on the school to prison pipeline. That we have young people who are talking deeply about what it means to create 
healthy places where we have schools that teach young people to grow. We bring in restorative practices. We teach young people that we cannot push out, punish, and expel the problems that are around them, that we have to build spaces of hope and dignity inside our schools as well. These are not easy struggles, but I want us to think that the path to progress has brought us through struggle, as Frederick Douglass has said, and that this nation has become better. We have found a path to progress through Brown v. Board of Ed. We have built ourselves up through the struggle of the Little Rock Nine and Ruby Bridges. We have become a stronger nation. And those places, like our public schools, where we find that opportunity to explore that, develop it, refine it, and hopefully to overcome it, overcome serious injustice, and redefine a new notion of civil rights is another reason why we need these places for the public to come together. And finally, I want us to think about the fact that our public schools matter so much because they matter the most to the people who need it the most. This is a city with a staggering level of poverty. It is of the top 10 major cities in the US, we rank number one. 28% of our fellow Philadelphians live in poverty. And an even more stunning fact, 39% of our children live in poverty. Too many of them will face hunger, homelessness. They will be likely to have unstable lives. They will be denied health care and struggle um, for basic services in their lives. And we have a choice as a city, as an educator, as, as a moral community. We have a choice to take young people in the most vulnerable moments of their lives and decide if we're going to compound that struggle with the neglect of the schools in which they attend or whether we are going to look at a child who's hungry and give them a freshly made lunch from their school cafeteria. Whether we look at a child who may not have health care and suffers from diabetes and asthma and say, we'll take care of you in our school. We've got a nurse for you. We can look at a child with dyslexia and offer them support services, reading specialists, and an opportunity to overcome their abilities. And then we also have an opportunity to take young people who are facing traumatic circumstances, who might be witnesses to violence in our communities. We have an opportunity to heal them, to bring them into a community, to offer them counselors, connection to social services, to offer them a warm and nurturing environment, and the possibility that they will grow and become stronger. I see all of these things as being possible within our schools. But that is a very different conversation from what we have about our schools today. There is no question. We're in a very, very different place. And I hope that we can think for a minute and think very deeply about why that is and what that calls us to do. Um, you know, these questions are deeply personal about what is happening within our schools. On the left, you see my niece's school. And on the right, you see my uh, daughter's school. Now, I'm not of the opinion that the exterior of a school defines the quality of the learning that goes on inside the building. But there's also no question that when my parents dropped off their granddaughters at their respective schools on their first day, the stunned silence that they had said everything, which is that there are places and schools where we will develop and cultivate and pour our collective will and resources into them to achieve the possibilities that I talked about earlier, and then there are the rest of us. And so we need to think very deeply about what that means. Um, a lot of times when I look at what's happening in our schools today, I look at what's happening to, this is my son's school, for example, what's happening in Philadelphia. We've seen spiraling disinvestment in this city, in our public schools. We've closed, in the last two years, we've closed 30 public schools. We stripped out basic resources from the best of schools. And I'll show you another slide of the other two schools. But this is what's happening amongst the best of our schools and it's impacting every single school across the city. And as we look at these issues of what's happening within our schools and how they're looking and what we're offering our children, we are now faced with a very serious question about where we are today. More than anything, um, our public schools, you know, as, as we, you know, oftentimes I have a lot of conversations with our policymakers, say, about what we're gonna do about this. And there's always two things that kind of come up with them. Um, first of all, that we start off with, well, what's the budget? You know, how are you going to close the gap? But very quickly, when we talk about money, we go right into what is the least amount of money that it will take to get you off my back? 
Or what is the least pain that we will give to taxpayers? What is the least hit to the bottom line of the budget? And ultimately, what we end up with is the least amount that we can possibly get. We negotiate down when we talk about dollars and money and we talk about our schools. The other thing that we tend to talk about with our schools today is we talk about outcomes. We're really into the achievement gap, outcomes, why aren't kids learning, where aren't they learning? And so we ask this question, which we've been asked many times, so uh, what am I getting for my investment? You know, what is, what's my return? And how are you gonna prove it to me? And so we look at a seven-year-old and we ask them to take these tests and we measure incremental gains in their test scores. And then we decide whether we're going to appropriate them the level of services that the test scores are supposed to help them get. And we are in an endless circle of churn and disinvestment and decline. And as our situation, needless to say, these kinds of conversations never end up very well. They don't solve the problem. We don't get to the root of the issue and we kind of recycled the same uh, conversations over and over, year after year. And it's funny because as the situation gets worse, we actually get very cold. We become more punitive in our rhetoric and our approach. We become seriously indifferent to the level of deprivation that we see in schools all across the city. And as we look at those numbers and we think about that, um, we are being offered a whole set of alternatives. Instead of dealing with this, we'll take a look at hyper-individualized choice models that have us looking and abandoning instead a collective responsibility for equitable and quality schools. Just the idea that, hey, maybe parents should just be customers and it's your responsibility to find your services instead of citizens who actually deserve their rights. And an institution which once was inspired and formed and shaped and imbued with what should have been love and possibility, hope for a future, is now surely being dismantled. Now, if you think that what's happening in our schools today is just a momentary moment in time, it's just a political fracas, or this is just a bump in the road, or this is just a natural state of growing pains for a system that's gone way too big for way too long you're gonna be missing a much bigger picture about what's happening in our schools today because we are in a very deep struggle. We're in a very deep moral struggle about the fate of our society and our schools. We see massively widening inequities in our income, in our standards of living for those in our city, for our fellow Philadelphians, and those are clearly reflected in our public schools today. And when we take a look at those institutions and then we decide whether this is really about, maybe we don't really need the public in public ed, what does that mean anyway? Then we are asking fundamental questions about civic values that have been long established. We're talking about a commitment to a collective enterprise, and we're talking about undermining the fundamental fabric that brings us together a lot. Now, I don't want this conversation to get lost into whether this is about reform versus status quo, whether you're for kids or against kids. You know, this isn't a conversation about whether we want excellent schools or teachers. The answer is yes and of course. I am a charter school founder. I believe in the possibility of schools and we heard some amazing stories today about some of those schools. I believe that there's a space for schools and for alternatives that help us grapple with uh, other ideas and ways of working within populations. And I believe that there is absolutely a role for schools to supplement the public school system. But that's not the conversation that we're having. The conversation is not about whether we can build schools that are in supplement to, but build schools that are now in lieu of. And that is a fundamentally different conversation that we're having. It's simply crazy to me that today, probably the most radical thing you can think to ask in our public school system today is to ask whether a child has a right to sing and dance in a Philadelphia public school during the course of their day. We can turn over school buildings, we can alter leadership, we can change the structures, we can change out curriculum and books, but we cannot figure out how to get a nurse in there five days a week. We can't get a counselor for college students to try and get their college applications in time. At my son's high school, many did not get their college applications in time. We, have, we cannot think about how to have a manageable class size. That these fundamental issues are now considered unreasonable. They're impossible 
for some students. And so when we think about how this goes, we have to think very seriously about where this language comes from and that we need to be honest that there is an education reform agenda that's out there, largely nationalized, born out of think tanks and boardrooms that is really circulating all throughout the country. It's not just Philadelphia, it is true. It's all over this country, from Detroit to New Orleans, Connecticut, Hartford, Chicago. We're all seeing a massive underchanging and challenging of the foundations of public education. And in this ed reform movement, there's a lot of crisis and churn. There's a lot of uh, things that are happening when leadership is AWOL and when the crisis of the moment tells you, let's just not worry so much about uh, due process or public transparency. This is a crisis. We've got to do something now. And we think about how the narrative of failure that comes along with it is silencing. It, dis it dissuades disengagement. It says you don't belong in this conversation because you already haven't done your job. It makes people think that it's not my place to interfere if things have gone so wrong. And I think that that has been rather purposeful. And it's not only that it does all those things, but it also allows us to open the door to all manner of reckless experimentation that's happened in schools lately. For over 12 years, Philadelphia Public Schools has endured a state takeover that has done nothing but perpetuate change and churn throughout the district. That what we've learned from reform is that it never sticks around, that it's only about change. It's only about turnover. We have principals that have been in their schools, nine principals in 10 years at one high school. In one instance, we had four principals in one year at another high school. This language of churn and change, hitting the reset button over and over and over again, and never once thinking that we slap labels on things. It's innovative, it's fresh, it's new, and in fact, it may be completely untested, completely reckless, and maybe, just maybe, totally irresponsible to perform on young people. We're being sold the idea that we can structure out inequity. We're being told that all we need is just a better managed model and we can handle this thing. And so we have issues where it's funny, teaching and the experience of teachers has now become a dirty word. We don't need that anymore. We can throw out some ideas like maybe test scores are in place of meaningful learning or we think about how um, curricula no longer matters as long as we get to the end and we measure those incremental gains in the test score as meanings of investment or disinvestment in our schools. That is enormously unhealthy. We value, we call for a longer school day without even thinking about the content of that day and what happens within the course of that day. There's something very wrong. It is an upside down world that we're in when we look at our public schools today. We have an opportunity, though, to change that. But before I be, I want to take a moment just to talk a little bit about school choice. Because I do think that it is a struggle to think through choice in the city of Philadelphia. Now, as I said, I'm a charter school founder. I believe that there are opportunities for choice. But I think that what's interesting is uh, the, the comedian Stephen Colbert, in interviewing Grover Norquist, said, you, sir, are my idol. Because I feel like you embody the motto of this nation, e pluribus unum, out of many. Isn't it just about me? <laughs> and I think about how the choice movement has become distorted, that we have reduced the idea of a collective responsibility to a public good to a series of individual choices for which that public good will be divested from. And that I want us to think about how the public good is now seen as a series of transactional behaviors. They're walking out, they're coming in. Um, you need to serve and, and customize your, your base a little bit better. And we've gone far away from notions of what is equitable, what is responsible, what's solid and important, and what really works. And we have to get away from the idea that it's simply okay to walk away from a public good. We have to get away from the idea that you can even walk away from fundamental problems of inequity and poverty. Choice will always be a sorry substitute for justice. So I want us to think a little bit about um, what we can do. Because there, are, there is a different way of looking at things. 
There's a different way of looking at things that reminds us that we have a collective enterprise together. And so much of the work that I try to focus on has a lot to do with rebuilding our sense of the public good and rebuilding our engagement with the collective enterprise that is it. I've learned a lot that our public spaces are very fragile. They don't stay forever if you don't care for them. We lose parks. We lose opportunities. We lose institutions in our neighborhood. And so we need to teach ourselves that we have to fight for those public spaces. We have to uplift them. And we have to pass down the lessons of preservation and community to our young people and to our fellow neighbors. And so at Asian Americans United, we spend a lot of time working on building vibrant investments in our public spaces. We'll take over a festival in Philadelphia Chinatown and take over the streets and remind people that this was a hard fought for neighborhood that required the investment of people to fight against development, to create the cultural space that we have. And in 10 years ago, when a proposed baseball stadium was built um, on the site of Chinatown, uh, the community fought back, but when we rethought about how we were going to build up, we built a school and we felt that children learning to sing and dance studying folk arts and bringing in their intergenerational elders to teach them about their storytelling and their crafts, when we serve many immigrant students, that this too is as valuable and vibrant and as much of an economic development as, as, a, as a baseball stadium, at least equal to, probably more. And we raise our young people most of all, to become leaders within our communities, to teach them to take care of their communities and to preserve the public trust. The second thing that I think about a lot is that we need to build alliances. A lot of us think that we're gonna solve these problems with a top-down structure. Just the right person needs to come in. Just the right leader needs to come in and fix this thing in our schools. And that has never, ever been the case. My son has seen six interim and hired superintendents during his years, and he is a ninth grader. This change in turnover isn't gonna come from the top. It's fundamentally gonna come from all of us, an alliance that we build among ourselves. And so we've built spaces for parents to come together. And again, our diversity is our strength. We have the pastor of one of the city's oldest uh, Baptist churches. We have a single dad raising his son in West Philadelphia. We have a mother of an autistic son, we have a home health care worker, a college counselor, and we come together across all of our different schools based on one principle only, that we have established a baseline for the basic level of services that all children, no matter what school they attend, are deserving and must have in every single school. And in a school district where we have often confused innovation with whatever's new and of the moment, and where revolving door leadership looks at things that are stable and successful as kind of boring, status quo. We remind them that, hey, it's great that you're starting three new high schools. Now, about my child's library, when is that gonna be opened? We talk about things like man manageable class sizes. We think about whether our young people need and have the number of support staff in their schools. We build this collective enterprise. We continue to talk and work around each other. We build leadership and we teach people that no one right now is ready to give you what your children deserve. We need to go out and articulate, call for it, and build the collective voice and leadership for it amongst ourselves. And I think a lot about how this movement and this moment has meant so much to our city and to our nation. Schools are ultimately a collective endeavor of all of us. And because that is every single one of us in this room, plays a powerful role in that. They are an opportunity. They should not be seen as broken institutions that need to be discarded or fixed or reformed and transformed and thrown out. Instead, we need to look at them as barometers of our own health as a society, of our care for our children, and that that health can dramatically change based on the investment or disinvestment that we put into it. Failure and success are not static when it comes to children. You will not fail forever, you will not succeed forever. You need the resources and the support to make that happen. And when we come together as a community and a collective enterprise, we remind people that that is so much of what is possible. And we also have to think today that we have an incredible calling 
when we talk and look at what's happening in our public schools, that we have an important and most essential message for our children who are all over the city and are desperately in need of our voices, that we have a mission to reform the city, that we have an opportunity to take this, to take this city and build in the most collective building that we've seen. Our schools can become a call to action in a time when all of us are so uh, distracted by our gadgetry. I think about how we're consumed today with individualism, consumerism, sort of lost with our iPhones and our iPads. And we forget that the collective spaces in which we figure out some of our most challenging solutions are becoming increasingly diminished. And we need those spaces now more than ever. We need to stop seeing our schools as problems. They are our opportunities. They are a call to action for all of us. Um, we need to see them as becoming and embracing them as the laboratories that they are, that they can be the laboratories to tackle some of the most difficult challenges in our city, that they can come together where we can build community and do collective healing, and that it is in that fundamental role that our public schools are both the frontier of hope and possibility and a necessary place of engagement. So when you see us out on the streets, when you see us marching and raising our voices, know that this is what this struggle is all about. And I'll end by saying a quote by um, the great historian and educator, uh, the late Howard Zinn, who said, if we remember the times and places where people have behaved magnificently, we at least have the energy now to act and to send the spinning top of a world in a different direction, to live as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is truly a marvelous victory. Thank you.